If you can wrap your head around what it is that you're doing, and if you can really find great enjoyment in what you're doing, then just go for it. Don't let anyone stop you. Um, and, and, and just be the best that you can be. And that's all I ever want from anyone who works, works here. Just go off and, and, and do something better than what you did here. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. We've talked about how many hospitality businesses are family run, but not so much how members of the same family can branch off and have a huge impact on their own. Siblings growing up in the same environment, but taking their inspiration and experience on different paths to carve their own path. Matt McConnell is the executive chef and co-owner of Barlarinia in Melbourne. Matt, how are you going? Pretty good, thanks, Huck. How are you? I'm good. You've um, got a couple of brothers that have made a bit of influence as well in the industry, and Andrew and Sean. How competitive is the sibling rivalry when it comes to food? I think we pretty much put our professional side to one side now um i think we've all been doing our thing for quite some time and we have our own goals um and aspirations and um if anything um probably a little bit more support now than than anything um for us just to to get on and do our own thing um which is always in, in the beginning probably the, the hardest thing because we all all sort of uh took off in the in the industry doing things somewhat linked, um, and then went on, went on our own ways. Well, you're all doing um, very different things and have really sort of stamped your authority as, uh, in your own right. Um, you've, you've got Bala in here at the moment. Uh, tell us about um, what it's like at the moment. You know, the last two years have been a bit of a hurdle, but what, what, what's the picture looking like at the moment? Yeah, it looks pretty good right now. Um, I think... The only thing that bothers me is up until Omicron, I pretty much had a pretty good crystal ball of how it was all playing out. Um, and so we, 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 I had a, a pretty good idea and prediction of when we were going to go into lockdown, when we were going to come out of lockdown, um, all those sorts of sort of challenges that popped up along, along that way. And then when Omicron came along, it was a real kind of out of the blue, like, Jesus, what the hell is this? And um, wasn't wasn't really ready for it. And I think probably the biggest effect was staff catching COVID whilst at work, um, which was really quite distressing, especially in December. Um, on, on paper, our December looks to be bigger and stronger than than any December trade that we'd done in our 16 year history. So it looks amazing, but then all, all of a sudden. Um, we had some staff catch it um, who were who were looking after a function upstairs in our private dining room. Um, so at that stage, all of us had to because we were all working together. We all had to get PCRs and wait. So we had to close for two days, and then similar thing happened again uh, later in the month. Um, we weren't able to trade. I think about six or seven days in the whole month because of. Um, just lack of staff or, you know, key key members having it and just not being able to field a, a strong enough team. Um, so it was pretty um, pretty devastating. And, and I think the only thing that got, got us through that is the customers were really accepting and understanding of it. And, and if anything, you know, it was quite obvious from mid-December, a group of 30 would only be 18 or 19. So we were really quite prepared for these juggles and downturns in in those group numbers um, but didn't really foresee having to close and then obviously coming through into January just uh, the staff shortage issue which is ongoing um, has been something that not, hasn't really been addressed a great deal especially in this election as well um, and it's and it's an issue not just for our industry but for so many other industries and it's global by, by, by from what I've spoken to people overseas so um, it's ongoing, but um, it does feel pretty good. Customers are a lot more settled now. They don't have to check in. We don't have to check for their vaccination status, um, all that sort of thing. So that sort of tension and anxiety that comes with the customer, but also has a fairly solid impact on our staff, is is thankfully relieved quite a bit. Um, but I think there's definitely going to be you know a good amount of post traumatic stress in the industry which will carry on for some time but we've got a great team we've got a great crew we've supported a lot of people through hard times and they've supported us through a lot of really difficult times um so it's it's kind of brought us together um but yeah no doubt 
uh, a lot of sleepless nights and stress and tearing out hair or losing hair and going grayer um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it does. It does feel a lot, a lot more, um, a lot more stable. You mentioned that uh, customers were a lot more understanding sort of during that period. Do you think the relationship between the operator and and customers has has changed through this experience? I think, um, I mean, we have a privileged position being in business for 16 years. So we have 16 years of ridiculously loyal clientele. So as soon as we had to go into lockdown, they were on the phone. They were emailing, what can we buy? You know, what, what, what are you doing this week? So the, that sort of um, support was was quite phenomenal. And I think it just strengthened my relationships with my business as well and going, oh, my God, we've, you know, we've actually done something for a long time that's actually um, been part of a very strong community. And I, ha- I don't think I'd really kind of acknowledged it. Um, you know, all these people who were having their, their wedding anniversaries, they had their first date at Ballerinia, they were in lockdown. They wanted to celebrate their wedding anniversary because they've met at our place. And, um, you know, people have gone on to have kids. And it's just, um, I think it, it did make it feel um, a little bit bigger than just a little bar in the city. Um, and that connection and that reach uh, is pretty pretty special and important. Bar- 16 years for Ballerinia is pretty incredible. And I want to explore what that 16 years has been like, but take us back to when you were young, what sort of role did food play in your family? Um, so I come from a, a very big family. So six, I'm one of six kids, um, fairly typically white Anglo-Saxon sort of upbringing. Um, but one thing that stood out was mum and dad, but mum especially was quite the, um, the gourmet and also wanted to sort of explore outside what she'd only learnt in a, in her time growing up and a very limited range of, of styles of food and she was quite adventurous and always trying different things, um, always entertained a lot. We always had people coming over. So, you know, a dinner table of eight, which would be normal, would grow to, you know, upwards of 20 or more um, and so food and food and drink was important um, but I think a lot of the things that we relied on was pretty much the staple of the time for white Anglo Australians um, a lot of lamb a lot of lamb sausages on the weekend um, the one thing that we did which was fun was a pizza night every Sunday night you know from making the dough to making pizzas as a family was always was good fun um, it was never the most important thing of the day, but I think sitting down at the table was more important rather than what was on the table. Um, and something that, you know, I've really wanted to do with my young family as well, make sure that we sit down and we eat and talk and um, explore the, what's going on in the day and what's going to happen tomorrow and then also do it over some, some lovely food as well. Do you remember when you first sort of got interested in, in food and considered a, a career as a chef? Yeah, look, I was kind of like a piggyback, I suppose, into the industry in that I, when I left high school, I'd kind of done very, very basic cooking at home. Um, while I was in high, high school, I'd maybe cook once a month or something, but it would, was very simple and not very good. Um, but and, and Andrew is a, a little bit older, a couple of years older than me, and he had entered the industry. Um, and so when I was at university, I ended up, um, getting part-time work, working as a kitchen hand, mostly in kitchens that he was working in. Um, so I did that for two, two and a bit years of my um, arts degree and then uh, realised that the arts degree wasn't really what I wanted to do and was just building up sort of that confidence and sort of looking around kitchens and just going, I kind of like this environment. You know, it's, it's a bit of pressure. Um, there's, there's definitely got a sense from the, the cooks at the end of their day that they've felt that they'd accomplished quite a bit um, and I just wasn't wasn't feeling that in, in my academic life at all um, and didn't really see the future in it so an op- opportunity sort of was thrown my way to start an apprentice, apprenticeship so I thought look I've got nothing to lose I can defer for a year do a first year apprenticeship weigh it up at the end of that year and um, as it turned out I was literally three or four months into it and it was not even a consideration to go back. I was just really enjoying that, that work environment um, 
and worked for some really, really good people. Um, a couple of bad ones at the start, but some really good ones also. So it was kind of good to have that mix of experience and sit, instead of not just all bad or all just too rosy. Um, sort of, sort of um, gave me a good, good picture of what the industry was consisted of. Um, but I was also exposed to other cultures as well, which is really, really cool. Um, which sort of had a, a, a big impact on where I went in in my future cooking. Well, what were some of the, the venues or, or people that sort of had a, a major impact on sort of the path that you have carved in those early years? Sure. Look, I, I, I made a conscious decision. Back then it was pr- pretty normal to, when you did an apprenticeship, you did pretty much your whole time at the one place. Um, and I just thought, saw that as, as a little bit too narrow because I wasn't really sure where I wanted to be in the industry. Um, so I, I purposely took jobs that were quite different. So I did a year um, in a – back then they were called a posh pub, so a gourmet pub, um, which, uh, which, which, is, which is great. So it was – you know, working in a pub is, is pretty, pretty interesting, um, really interesting people. Um, and the food was great. I worked with a fantastic chef there called Tony Garita um, and learned a lot from him. Um, really passionate guy, really super passionate. Um, and T. Ezard was the sous chef for a little while there as well. So I got to you know, meet you know, some pretty, pretty incredible people at their, 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 it, on their journey as well. Um, I, after that, I did a year in a cafe called Rumbarellas, which was a pretty groundbreaking little cafe in Brunswick Street at the time. Fresh made pasta every day. Um, just did things right, you know, and I, I learned a lot from that experience. Um, and the freshness of the of, of what what they did was really interesting. Um, and then after that, I did a year at a French bistro, which I'll just pass on that one because it just didn't it didn't fit, didn't fit me at all. I, it was probably the one link out of the four years that I did that just didn't quite a, quite gel. I wasn't quite. I wasn't very good to begin with, so I'll take I'll take that. But it just wasn't right for me. Um, and then the last year of my apprenticeship, I did with Tansy at Tansy's in Spring Street, um, and that sort of she was she was pretty groundbreaking. In I just learned um, so much from her in in a short time. Um, she's extremely giving. Like I don't think I've worked with anyone that actually gives so much to her to her craft and to her customers and to her staff. It was quite quite um quite pivotal i think in my professional sense um, but then post that i'd probably the last i think it was the last year of my apprenticeship i met my my now wife so we were partners for a while before getting married and she's half italian half greek so that's that sort of took me on another journey of discovering food which was going to her family villages in both the south of italy and also on a little little island in greece where i think I think we travelled for 10 months the first time we went, which was in 95. So I was probably only a year out of my apprenticeship. Um, and those nine months spent between Italy and Greece, living in a little village in Italy where no one spoke English. And they had every, they grew everything, made everything. Um, it was probably I probably learnt more in that nine months than I did my whole apprenticeship and the other side that I learnt not just the cooking part was the hospitality side which you, you just don't get that I think we didn't get that back then in in um in an apprenticeship um so just to see what it's like to sit down at a table um everyone comes together brings all this produce from their farm and if there's a group of families meeting someone will bring the wine someone will bring the lemon shell or um, in Greece, it was someone would bring the feta down from from the farm, and there was another little plot of land where they pick all the all the the vegetables for the salad, and would all make the salad together and sit down, talk, and and drink and and have fun, um, which kind of resembled a little bit what I did growing up with my family, but it was a whole other cultural edge and twist and and an eye opener, which kind of set me on a a new course, I think, and reset me in the direction that I've, I've sort of continued on. What was it like stepping back into commercial kitchens after such a um, beautiful and unique experience in Italy and Greece? <laughs> it was really hard. It was really difficult. Probably the main thing is I just wanted to go back as well. It was uh, such, a, such a, a, a powerful impact. Um, 
and you know had a, had the opportunity to go and live and work in London like ever, like everyone it was almost the rite of passage kind of thing, and I um, got it landed a job and I was just like, why the hell am I putting myself in a in a basement, in cold London in the middle of winter, two hundred pound a week was the offer, so I was going to be losing about two hundred quid a week to to take the job where I can go and live off the land and and um, experience something a little bit more 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 relevance and and something that I can also take back as experience to to Australia eventually so that was always my back of my head to to keep traveling to go back but I sort of squandered a few jobs and was doing a bit of casual work and a bit of this until I I've, I got the opportunity to to run a kitchen called at uh, Harry Canary um, which I think I landed that in late 96 um, so I ran, I ran that for three years three to four years and that was a, a great job um, on many levels because I was able to apply a lot of the things that I'd picked up on travels and use it um, quite constructively in the commercial kitchen. Um, it was a time in, in the city of Melbourne where there weren't that many venues, but you could see the CBD really starting to change and have the opportunity to change. Um, and so being part of that was, was great. Um, I got to see see the city go from you know lights out at six o'clock no and the streets would be empty to you know um this the city council would be throwing comedy festivals and this and that and there'd be people on the street all night wanting to go out and bar culture started to was born um sort of in that time as well in the cbd and um yeah it was it was a really positive um part of my cooking actually and having my first head chef position doing that was um was just really set me up, I think, um, and I worked worked hard. Um, I think all that early training of working hard really paid off, and it did. It didn't feel like hard work. Um, it was quite quite satisfying. Um, started to make connections, early connections with um, not so much farmers, but more people at the markets. Um, and I think that's when I started to question why have I been cooking in a city, and I don't even know where my herbs come from I don't know so I started to start exploring that a bit towards the end of my time at um, Harry mm. Canary um, yeah what, what's, what did you do in Melbourne leading I know you spent some time up in Noosa as well before Barlarinia but mm. in the lead up to that gig what, what was sort of the main um, moments for you I think um, Harry Canary was pretty critical also, opening dining room two hundred one with Andrew um, was a pretty major, major stepping stone for both of us. Um, and and Sean Sean's quite a bit younger than, than both of us, so he was kind of only just at that point, sort of making decisions about where to go in the industry as well. So there was looking like all of a sudden, the Von Trapp family chefs were coming coming strong and fast. It was. Uh, um, and you know, and obviously with that came a lot of lot of pressure. It's like, why are you a cookie? You must, mum must be a fantastic chef. Blah blah blah. And it's kind of like, well, we didn't really overthink it that much until that point when everyone wanted to know why they're three chefs. So um, with that um, came a little bit of weird stuff, um, I think. And um, and dining room wasn't the right fit for me as well and and then an opportunity came I got a, a cold call from Jim Barato up in Noosa and said um, I hear you looking for work why don't you come up for a weekend we'll have a chat I'll show you what we've got and we'll take it from there and I just went you know it's a no strings opportunity to go up to Noosa um, have a couple of days and I just thought look if it doesn't work out at least I'll probably go have a swim at the beach you know it'll be it'll be fun um, and I got there and I was really kind of blown away with their operation, their outlook, um, but also their connection to their, their community and their farms and their fishermen. And I just thought, wow, this is something I could really jump on. Um, and also just really, really fell in love with Jim and Greg as well. They were really, really good people um, wanting to do really big things for a small town. So um, I just thought... This is this could really work. So Joe and I made the move move north, um, which um, I learned a lot in that time. Um, I think the restaurants I, I ran the bistro and then ran the restaurant, and I once again they weren't really the most perfect fit for me, but I still managed to 
really learn a lot and bring a lot to those venues just by um, connecting with really good farmers and fishermen and all the suppliers that you dealt with up there and some really good young cooks as well. Like I was really surprised at how strong the, the cooking culture was up there as well. Um, and plus as well, I've I, I'd gone from doing, you know, 80 weeks, 80 hour weeks and you'd finish at midnight and you'd get home at six o'clock in the morning and then you'd sleep all day. And, and it went from that to all of a sudden I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning I'd either go fishing before before work, or I'd go go swimming before work. Um, on my break, if I was doing a split shift, I'd go go to the beach and swim for an hour, and then go back and cook. And just kind of like, um, sort of slowed my uh, my process down a, a lot. I think by by having that lifestyle and just going, oh, there's more to life than what I what I'd been doing. So it was a good it was a good change of change of pace, but but still. Um, had having a finger on the pulse, and you know, I, I got to meet, meet the, some of the most incredible chefs and hospitality people um, in Noosa um, because Jim and Greg always, obviously, they set up the festival, so I was I was part of that at the very infancy as well, and um, got to meet some really amazing people, and and that sort of had a great impact on me as well, I think. Um, and I think at, at that point when I was was time to leave Noosa, which is when I was sort of craving to do something of my own in Melbourne, um, but didn't really know what it was going to be, um, which is why we, we took off overseas for a year, spent most of it in Spain and Portugal, um, headed back to, to the family in both Italy and Greece again, but spent most of it in Spain and Portugal, which is when we, we went, this is what we have to do when we get back. We're not sure how we're going to do it or what it's going to look like or... Um, but we just sort of knew that that, that was the, the style of, of eating and drinking that we wanted to, to bring back to, to Melbourne. Um, and, you know, the, that journey turned into, you know, looking at bars and how high, the, what was the best height for a bar stool and um, all the little things and bits and pieces that make a great bar to eat at. Um, and... Then it was quite quite glaring obvious to us about the, the style of hospitality that you get in those places. Some of them, some of the towns we'd go to, we didn't speak. We spoke limited Spanish, um, but they'd welcome us into their bar like it was their home. And I, I think that really resonated with with Joe and myself about how how good hospitality can be. Um, and we really wanted to bring just that slice, I think, um, back to Melbourne, and which ended up being Barlarinha. Were there challenges bringing this concept into the market uh, in Melbourne at the time? Um, I think we were incredibly lucky. Um, we we found the site um, while we were on the last part of our journey, which was in Greece. Jo was um, having waiting to get her Greek passport, um, which was just that bureaucratic nightmare, but it just meant that we ended up spending about two and a half to three months on Samos, a tiny little island, which is, it's a very Greek island, not a highly touristed island. So um, we lived off the land there and stayed in um, uh, an uncle's house and uh, um, wrote a lot of recipes. Um, back then it was, uh, I think it was uh, plug-in internet. There was an internet cafe and we would go down there just to send emails and stuff. And uh, we, we found a, a real estate site and found the site at 37 Little Collins Street. Thought that that looks absolutely perfect for what we want to do. Came back, called the agent. It was rented already. Said sorry. And so, Joe, having just been fresh off the boat back from uh, from the Mediterranean, said, "I'm going to put my grandmother's curse on whoever's leased it, and you'll be hearing from me. You'll be you know." She said, "You'll be calling me." This, this is her exact words. Uh, and I was just, she's hung up and I was just, I said, Joe, you can't do that. You can't say this. And no, nope, he'll be calling me. Watch. So sure enough, about two or three weeks later, we got a phone call so, from uh, the agent saying, hey, uh, the uh, partnership has folded on that uh, that property. Do you want to come and have a look at it? And we, were, we basically went there that day and signed up straight away. So that was a bit of luck. Um, but I think also Melbourne was right for the picking in, in um, 2006. There was... Um, Really, only Mavida doing what we wanted to do, and they were doing a great job. Um, but we could see um, things really starting to happen. So, Long Grain, I opened, I think, in 
the end of 2005. So that's down I know I went on Little Burke Street. There's a couple of other little hole, holes in the wall sort of popping up here and there, up up that end um, of, of Little Collins Street. So we saw it as, you know, a prime opportunity to, to move in. Um, the ramp was good. Um, had, a, had a friend build the bar for us and, you know, Big borrowed steel basically to, to make it all happen and, and took in a took in a partner as well to, to make it happen. Had to sell a house, our home to do it. Um, so you know it was it was it was like an all in gamble, but um, it just kind of it just kind of sent sent normal. It didn't seem like a risk take at, at the time. Um, looking back, it, it's probably pretty bonkers, um, but. At the, at the time, it just kind of seemed normal, and that's what we were supposed what what we were destined to do. Um, probably, always we set it up wanting to be those places that we went to in Spain that were 40, 50 years old. You know, like a lot of that hospitality was more driving to us than, you know, the Michelin star places and the, the fancier bars. Um, and so we all, always kind of hope that you know that's the hospitality we bring, and you know maybe we'll make it to 10 years or 12 years, um, but turning 15 in a lockdown was last year was kind of like oh geez we've, we've made 15 um didn't get to have a party but um it was kind of, just kind of figured uh figured you know that's a that's a pretty bloody monumental um milestone for you know a little little bar sort of mar and pa run kind of style you know we're very hands-on still very passionate about what we did what we do um and i think I think pandemic kind of brought us right back into those roles as well. We we were probably a little bit more one step out of the business at the time, and pandemic has got us back in. Um, but um, yeah, it's still still doing what it's doing, which is great. Tell us a little bit about your food, and has it changed much over the last sixteen years? Good question. I think it's changed a little. Um, I'm not overly influenced by trends. I'm probably more influenced purely by my own travels and what I read. Um, but yeah, usually, usually traveling is is the ground um, for where everything kind of comes from for us. Um, and in addition to that, you know, just having you know buying fish from the same guy for sixteen years. You know, you have a have a relationship. With him, you know, you you call him Malaka when he sends you the bad stuff, and 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 norm, normally I don't have to do that. So you know, you become really good good friends with people, and you you develop lifelong um, relationships with people. And then you hop on a plane, you go somewhere, and you go, geez, why didn't I think of this? Why? How did I miss out on this? And um, then you just gradually evolve it into. Um, into the menu and I think menu structure has stayed pretty pretty much the same you know we do tapas and racionas a couple of cheeses some desserts so that structure is always hasn't changed at all we've never gone dego or this or that um it's always been in that sort of style um but um just you know knowing you know Chloe's gonna have ripe habaneros you know come April time so I can make some really hot sauce and um then I know what's going to be coming up next um from someone else. Unfortunately, one of my, my one of my farmers who I've used for many many years has uh, um, just retired uh, after buying from him for over twenty years. And the sad the sad thing with that is his his family um, don't want to take on the, the the family business. So all of that that knowledge and that heritage um, from from Albert and he's a, he's an old Italian mar- farmer market gardener. Uh, is gone. Um, but but one thing that's really positive is is there is a younger breed and a younger generation of farmers out there who who are doing incredible things and bringing beautiful produce to the city. And they're they're not far away. They're they're really local. Um, and so that's that's a probably my my strongest drive and inspiration at the moment, mainly because I haven't been able to travel. Um, is just having those those relationships and working with them really closely with people in the past I've, I've i've found produce on travels and taken photos of it and said what's this and can you grow it and sure enough and you know a year later i've got these amazing african horn melons coming in which were these crazy things that i saw at the market in, in lisbon um and, and stuff like that so it's um really nice having that connection and working with people 
I think the last time I saw you was a couple of years ago and you'd um, gone back to Noosa and, and cooked with your brothers for the first time in a long time. What, what was that like? That was pretty good fun, actually. Yeah, it's a bit of a blur now. Um, that's a few years ago. And we, we don't do it very – I think we've done it once since then. Um, but, yeah, it's um, – I don't know. It's quite a surreal feeling to cook with – both of them at the same time. Um, I have cooked with Sean once on one occasion, and he came down and cooked once at Ballerina. But it is it is quite quite different. Um, and you know the jo- the Von, Von Trapp family singer joke is you know it's pretty strong. You know when it comes to, to three cooks. Um, and you know the real irony is everyone knows about the three brothers, but no one knows about the three sisters. You know, and the three sisters are all all incredibly good home cooks um, who who all love food. They're all good at it. Um, but they've chosen a completely different path in life, which is which is in hospitality. So, um, yeah, it's real. I, I still find it pretty pretty surreal, actually. Sixteen years is incredible for um, any restaurant, not any place on the planet. Um, what, what do you love about what you do? Oh, uh, I think it's definitely the people. I do. I, do, I, I love cooking, but the people are uh, are what makes it brilliant or makes it terrible you know bad customers completely completely ruin a night um great customers can actually make you a year so it's it's one of those fine lines um and then just working with closely with um young cooks and just trying to get in their head you know it's not all about being famous it's about just do what you love you know really just if you can if you can wrap your head around what it is that you're doing and if you can really find um, great enjoyment in what you're doing, then just go for it. Don't let anyone stop you um, and, and, and just be the best that you can be. And that's all I ever want from anyone who works, works here. Just go off and, and, and do something better than what you did here. It's really, really important. Um, and it's also how the industry will evolve um, uh, in a positive, positive way because uh, still quite a lot of hate towards uh, our industry. Um, and but it's, a, it's an important part of, of um, culture, especially Melbourne culture. I think Melbourne culture is very, very driven by um, dining out, eating out, drinking out. Um, yeah. Well, Matt, it's an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today just to hear a bit of your story. Um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Huck. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.